everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Jane Hour. We're your hosts, Maddie, Aubrey, Maya, Lindsay, Rose. Shout out to Mrs. Butler for making us do this. We really love it. <laughs> <laughs> this week, we're talking about enclosure and escape, repression and disempowerment of children. So Maya's going to start us off with um, some places where we see disempowerment of children. All right. The first and the most obvious place that you see the disempowerment of children is probably chapter 2, page 1617, when you um, you can overhear uh, the uh, Miss, what's her name, Bessie, Miss Abbott, talking about um, Jane's bad disposition, and they tell her... <clears throat> That it's her place to try and make herself agreeable to them, referring to the reeds, even though they're terrible to her. And I thought that that kind of separate that separates her from uh, the reeds as if they're not actually her family, when in reality they are. And it takes away that blood tie, and like therefore rendering her kind of it, less than a servant, as they say. Mm. Mm -hmm. Also on that page. Uh, Miss Abbott says that God will punish her. He might strike her dead in the midst of her tantrums. Which is, like, insane to tell to a ten-year-old. Mm -hmm. right? That, yeah. like, God is gonna punish them. Mm -hmm. like, and especially when you're so young. Mm -hmm. You take everything so seriously. Right. Especially, like, with the fantasy stuff. Like, she believes that it's real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the Red Room. Mm -hmm. Things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And I think from the very first page of the book you get the sense that Jane is, like, repressed from the group, from the reads, from everything, because she says, mm -hmm. me, she had dispensed from joining the group. And I feel like that sets up the mood for the rest of the book, of her just being an outcast, but she didn't want to be. Right. Like, she's just being shunned out of everything. And then, like, even later, like, I feel like she's so used to being mistreated and, like, abused. Like, I have a quote where she says, um, I was well received by my fellow pupils, treated as an equal of those of my own age, and not molested by any. And, like, that, like, shows that, like, she's so used to be, like, abused mm -hmm. and, like, mm -hmm. treated like a lesser person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, going back to what I said, like, when you're taught that you're n of no use to anyone, mm -hmm. where like, and it's the only place that you've known your whole life, it's hard to believe that anyone else could love you. Mm -hmm. And that kind of ties in with um, how surprised, well I guess not surprised, but how, how, like when she's with Rochester, her joy feels like, a, like from another world. <laughs> kind like of. almost wrong to her. Yeah, she no, yeah, yeah, yeah. She yeah. suppress it so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because another thing that she's taught from a young age is that her passion and her feeling, like, is horrible and it's bad. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing that makes, gives her that bad disposition and that's what she's going to be punished for. And that causes her, like, to repress those feelings as well as, I think, um, like, a really big part of her nature in, like, being able to feel things and react to them authentically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, even... In the end of the first chapter, before she's um, sent away to the Red Room, uh, I think it's either Abbott or Bessie that say, did you ever see anybody, did ever, did ever anybody see such a pa picture of passion? Mm -hmm. Like, she, like in the first chapter she's called that, in like such a bad context. Mm -hmm. When we've known it as something that's good and that's beautiful, but all mm -hmm. she knows is to repress it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think passion is a good thing and it is beautiful, but they just think her passion is being this terrible child or whatever and so she grows up with the mindset that any of all any and all of her passions are like negative. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um yeah. so even if she does have a passion that's not terrible or whatever, she's just like, Oh, it's my passion, I can't pursue it. And that right. says, like, about her character, like, the reader can, like, sympathize for her and, like, because she pushes mm -hmm. those emotions deep down inside her. Mm -hmm. So, like, it makes you kind of feel bad for her and, mm -hmm. like, hope for the best for her. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I have some more. I mean, like, it's not even just her, like, Jane as a child that was repressed, but also Adelaide. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. she's been tossed around, how she doesn't know yeah. that Rochester's her dad. She doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, and I, Rochester isn't her real dad. He's not? No. No. Oh, mm -hmm. because he, he, like, pitied her, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. he, he got, like, stuck oh, with her. Okay. He, no, they were like, this is your child, and he was like... It's not, but I guess if she's got nowhere else to go, <laughs> yeah. I'll take care of her. Uh huh. And that kind of way, yeah. that kind of relates to Bertha, kind of. Mm -hmm. Like, sh he put Adele in the same place that he put Bertha. Mm -hmm. That's another it's story. It's a pity place. Like, yeah. yeah, I feel like that's why, another reason why Jane is so drawn to him is because, you know, he's like, not like a father figure, but like, someone to look up to. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, she was so like repressed and like treated horribly as a child uh-huh mm -hmm. and i go ahead she wants like the opposite of that in the mm -hmm. future mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i also think that's why she and adele or however you pronounce her name that's get, what i was gonna say yeah. get along so well is that they both come from a place where they're being repressed and adele not in such a bad sense as jane was but just a sense like oh stupid little child whatever like mm -hmm. she's just never felt like anything that she wants to do is like worth anybody's time mm -hmm. visit mm -hmm. rochester's always just like mm. and i think that's why they connect so much and that mm. brings me to my question <clears throat> for the group um what parallels do you guys see between adele's childhood and jane's childhood i feel like going along the lines with what you said mm -hmm. um they're i they like they they are similar but at the same time, they're both used to being treated like, like that way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? That's so they don't know, know any different. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But now that Jane is older, she recognizes that in Adele mm -hmm. and wants Adele to be treated better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She wants her to have that love and affection that Jane didn't. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I really saw that when Adele wanted to go to town or wherever they were going in the carriage with them. Yeah. And Rochester's mm -hmm. like, no. And then she's like, come on, let her go. And then Adele like mm -hmm. was allowed to ride. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's Jane identifying um, their common yeah. childhood um, in her and wanting to change mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she even says, like, Adele first sits on the side of Rochester and she's like, no, you can come over here. And then she describes... Yeah. Adel Adelaide is being, like, passed over, like, a little lap dog, mm -hmm. which I think is, like, mm -hmm. so weird, but it's, like, she's almost like that, mm -hmm. in a sense, where she's just, like, oh. kind of there, but then she's sent away to, like, the nursery all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she also doesn't know any better, like, mm -hmm. a little puppy. Right. She's just like, yeah. all right, I'll be, like, passed along, you know. Mm -hmm. Also, when she's... I feel like Mr. Rochester treats her as a disruption. Mm -hmm. multiple times like yeah. at, mm -hmm. in that instance and when she is in the room with him he sends her to play with Pilot he sends her to the other end of the room to open her presents and be mm -hmm. quiet while you're opening your presents mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah. and I feel like that's ironic for him because he took her on himself like mm -hmm. sure he might have felt obligated to but at the end of the day you can go that's not my child and I don't want them in my life it's not my problem but he chose to take her in mm -hmm. and yet he's choosing to treat her badly yeah or it's poorly al it's almost better yeah. if he just left her in that situation mm -hmm. let her be then, poor and happy right mm -hmm. well I don't think she's unhappy no not necessarily I think yeah, she's just clueless yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I think mm -hmm. she's just getting stepped over like mm -hmm. treated mm -hmm. yeah I think it that's a like big parallel between Jane and Adele. Like Jane had the option at one point where like talking to Mr. Lowood where she had that option to leave. Mm -hmm. But um maybe that... Adele doesn't have that the same kind of option, but um like Jane when she was there, she recognized that like there's a huge class difference probably between what her relatives were and mm -hmm. who like the Reeds. So if she chose to leave that than she would have been for, and she wasn't willing to sacrifice that, and I have a feeling that Adele would be kind of the same way, mm -hmm. just because of, like, what we, like, see of her character, like, being really fond of presents and things like that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, like, um, even if she had gotten more respect, not to say that that would really have been the case, mm 
mm-hmm. like to be with a family who was poorer who might actually be her family mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. is that really an option that she would have been willing to take and mm-hmm. would that actually have made her happier or not yeah cuz we see we see like the childhood of rich like up upper class families but we don't see the poorer families so there isn't really a way to gauge mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, the, that it is actually better. Mm-hmm. And I think in Jane's childhood, you see the repression, and she's, like, in a school, and it's not great. Or with the reeds, and it's not great. And Adele has, like, this really nice place to stay, wealthy mm-hmm. father figure. And they're both experience, experiencing the same type of repression mm-hmm. and, like, disempowerment as children. Mm-hmm. Even though they grew up in totally different situations. Mm-hmm. And going back to, um, well, now I forgot what I was going to say. Well, oh, having the option to leave that repression. Mm-hmm. And maybe mm-hmm. that's why, because Jane was given the option to go to Lowood, and now Jane wants Adele to go to school. So maybe that's mm-hmm. a motive of Jane's to get Adele away, maybe? Mm-hmm. Well, she yeah. wanted her to go when she thought Ingram was Yeah, when she got him. Yeah, because... Right. Because she recognized oh, how bad. Too. Because yeah. oh, maybe she, she sees a similarity in Ingram and Mrs. Reed. Reed. Yeah, because mm-hmm. she would verbally abuse Adelaide too, calling her a brat and like a mm-hmm. plaything. Yeah, true. Yeah. Very true. Do we wanna? Well, move on? Let's see. oh, I also saw. Um, Hold on. <laughs> I also saw that how Rochester had the choice to take on Adele. Like, not really a choice, but he could have easily said, no, I don't want to take care of you type of a thing at the start. How Mrs. Reed got, kind of got stuck in that obligation to take mm-hmm. care of Jane after her uncle passed away. Even though she had that obligation, the moral obligation to take care of her, she could have also, mm-hmm. like, hey, hit the road. Mm-hmm. But they both took them on, and they both put that energy that of them not wanting to take care of them into the kids. Yeah, because mm-hmm. when Reed is dying, she, like, says to Jane, like, I've hated that child since birth. Mm-hmm. Since, like, mm-hmm. and yeah. how can you hate an infant, almost? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. it's p- impossible. They can't do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mm-hmm. think she almost hates the fact that she's stuck with her. And just blames it on her because she has no, nothing else to do in her head, even though she could have, like, yeah. put her up for adoption or, like, I don't know, given her to another family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She, I think she just put that anger into her, and that's why she hated her. Yeah, and then it, like, went down to her children, mm-hmm. where John mm-hmm. became abusive, and Georgina, and mm-hmm. the other one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, she, so to wrap up the chat... The Repress- oppression, repression of children. Of children. Uh, similar, so there's similar similarities between Jane and Adele. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I have I have one more question. Um, so when uh, Mrs. Reed is sending off, or getting ready to send off Jane to Lowood, and Mr. Brocklehurst comes to visit, and she's telling Mr. Brocklehurst about how horrible Jane is. Uh, my question was, why does she feel the need to tell Mr. Brocklehurst about Jane's evils? Like, especially if Mrs. Reed and everybody in the house believes her to be such an evil child, why should she need to explicitly say that? I think it's, like, a power thing. I don't Mm -hmm. know. Um, like, I feel like having, like, the ability to call, like, a child evil and just, you know... It's so traditional, I guess. I don't know how to explain it, but I feel mm-hmm. like she just feels like she should have more power over the children. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. like it's like cancel cu- culture. Like, saying someone's mm-hmm. evil gives you power almost. Yeah. It mm-hmm. gives you, like, that energy mm-hmm. that you are better than that person. Mm-hmm. And I think just the obligation to fill the adult role mm-hmm. of yeah. being a parent or a caretaker. It's just like, I'm bigger than you whatever, you listen to me type of a thing. Instead of having that mutual respect, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's just a role that lots of adults try to fill in this book. Also, Mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. A lot of my take on it was, um, 
Jane, I think, in Mrs. Reed's eyes is really considered also like a part of the, the lower cast. Mm -hmm. And yeah. part of being in that lower cast is that you have to be forced into this humility and self-loathing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, she's going to think that she's worth more than she actually is oh. because she's she actually doesn't have anything. She doesn't have family. She has nothing. Mm -hmm. And that... As far as she knows. Yeah. So that because of that, she should feel horrible about herself and that she should be kept down and that also has a lot like that also really plays into Mr. Brocklehurst's school because a lot of what he teaches there is um uh on page 75 he says that he um wants to teach the girls to be hardy patient and self-denying so essentially taking away their ability to like give themselves what they want and do mm. pursue the things that matter to them mm -hmm. and Even, like that yeah and that also that his job is to mortify them and dress them with shamefacedness mm -hmm. as opposed to giving them the power that they have. <laughs> Even because naturally, because he, he mm -hmm. sees the girl's natural red curly hair and he's like, get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> Even yeah. though it's natural to her. But it's so like, yeah. weird because he doesn't want them to like dress up or anything, but like mm -hmm. her getting rid of that natural curls is dressing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Almost, mm -hmm. which is... So ironic, I want to say. Either way, Hypocr she's it's strange. Hip yeah. Hypocritical. Hypocritical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Either way, with the curly hair that he doesn't like, or with a shaved head, she's going to look different, and she's going to mm -hmm. stand out and have that individuality that he's trying to get rid of mm -hmm. in all the girls. So I don't, I guess that doesn't make sense to me, like, his motive. Mm -hmm. I think, like, going back to the question, it's like, um how they were raised maybe it was just passed down like that discipline like you must be very disciplined and you must be quiet mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know like the passion mm -hmm. versus reason thing you must be like reasonable oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i yeah. have a quote for that so actually mm -hmm. where, so where oh where is it but sh there's this one instant where um Mrs. Reed, oh, here it is. Be seated somewhere, and until you can speak ple pleasantly, remain silent. That was literally <laughs> the quote. Yeah. Quote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of like, say what I want you to say, or don't speak at all. Yeah. Like, like, um, I don't know what the word is, but. It's not just like the old-fashioned quote where, like, speak, um, only speak when you're spoken to. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. only speak what I want you to say which like jane doesn't even know yeah mm -hmm. because she's been told every action she's ever done is bad and that her passion's bad her true nature's mm -hmm. evil so if jane followed suit with that she just wouldn't say anything at all she'd be like well and i think mm -hmm. that but she doesn't exactly mm -hmm. and she that's that her. passion that's always mm -hmm. repressed i know we're not talking about passion in this episode but i feel like it's <laughs> such evident in her character in the book though you kind of can't go around it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very true yeah. mm -hmm. and it's like even after Lilwood and being taught that her passion is bad that she needs to repress it like I feel mm -hmm. a lot of that repression is taught by Lilwood and like the standards that they hold to the students but also like holding herself to Helen Burns standard yeah. of being quiet accepting punishment and automatically because you received that punishment assuming that it you deserved it for whatever reason mm -hmm. and like from the start Jane didn't believe that but she tries really hard to like mm -hmm. by the end of her years at Lowood and when she first meets Mo Mr. Rochester um like even he mentions I think that um that it's like with her like when she's so apt to respond that it's kind of surprising because the facade that she puts on is that she's trying to be reasonable mm -hmm. and that she's trying to be like simple plain when in reality she's got a lot more going on underneath her than people are willing mm -hmm. or would like to recognize. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're kind of like leading into the topic of repression so like I have a question. Like, do you think that since, like, Jane, like, holds herself back throughout her whole life, is it an ethics thing? Or is it, like, trauma? Mm. I think it's a... I think it's both. I think it's trauma, but she thinks it's ethics and morals. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I think she's just been... Not... I guess not traumatized... Well, traumatized into... 
just believing from the very start that um, staying silent is like the ethical thing, the moral thing. Mm. But she doesn't want to do that anyway. I don't know where I'm going with this, so like anybody take over. <laughs> she knows that no one will get mad if she doesn't say anything. Right? Maybe. <clears throat> I feel like she might have like a little bit of post traumatic stress disorder or like some sort of Well of course, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Sort some sort of thing from like the red room. Yeah. yeah. As a mm-hmm. child and she'd just been like questioning herself ever since Mm -hmm. she oh yeah she ever yeah i don't i can't speak but um (laughs) throughout the whole up till like what we've read now she references the red room Mm -hmm. like multiple times like so Mm -hmm. her red room experience has followed her Mm -hmm. throughout her Mm -hmm. whole life because she keeps remembering it and comparing it to where she is now i think her whole Mm -hmm. mindset throughout her entire life is the red room like the red room Mm -hmm. is a part of her it is her in some ways Mm. so Mm -hmm. i don't know how exactly that connects to your question but i felt like that was a good thing to say yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah but your question, I think it's, they go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. It is the traumatic thing because, yeah. or it is the ethical thing because that's how she was traumatized and like mm-hmm. brought up to believe, to stay silent mm-hmm. or to do anything that she does. Mm-hmm. It all comes um, and goes back to the trauma that she had as a kid. That yeah, she's been falsely taught that it's ethics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And not even just as a kid. Throughout her entire life, she's yeah. experienced trauma in one way or another through right. somebody or somebody else. Throughout her entire life, she's experienced mm-hmm. enclosure and escape. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if that's why she keeps referencing it, because mm-hmm. she feels enclosed. She feels that she's going somewhere. She feels enclosed. She feels like she's going somewhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is like, because that was like the very first time she really felt like trapped. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. she like couldn't. So forget. she, yeah. So she pairs that trapped feeling with mm-hmm. other things that make her feel that trapped feeling again. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Unless there's something else that anybody wants to add, I feel like we've kind of tiptoed around the escape aspect of the episode. Yeah. So yeah. I I think, um, in regards to escape, um. She can't ever really physically escape <laughs> something. Like, she can't just run out because people are going to be like, um, hello, you belong here. Like, we take oh. care of you. <laughs> well, she could, but she hasn't. <laughs> I feel like she thinks she's trapped. So her escape comes in solitude rather than in being by herself. Or, not being by being in a group or being with people. Mm-hmm. On page 340... She said, the house cleared, I shut myself in, fastened the bolt that none might intrude, and proceeded not to weep, not Mm -hmm. to mourn, but mechanically take off my wedding dress and replace uh, replace it by the stuffed gown I'd worn yesterday, as Mm -hmm. I thought for the last time. So she just kind of, after that whole fiasco with Bertha and everything, (laughs) she just kind of went into her room, locked the door, and she's like, no. Bertha, can't deal with you. Rochester, can't deal with you and she just kind of shut herself away and that was her escape even though it's kind of a trapping feeling to like bolt yourself in your room Mm -hmm. she did it herself she wasn't being locked in the red room she locked herself in out in and out and And that's her escape yeah i was saying that in class like sometimes enclosure is her escape Mm -hmm. in a way Uh uh-huh not Mm -hmm. Sometimes they contradict each other, but sometimes they're the same thing. It's it like, depends on the... It's consensual enclosure mm-hmm. that she consents to doing that. Because that's where to. she feels safe, mm-hmm. being alone. Yeah. Rather, because, like, all these people around her have only ever betrayed her. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And yeah. with that, like, the symbol of birds, like, that represents both enclosure and escape. Because, like, you know, like, they can be in a cage and they can be enclosed, but then they escape and fly away Mm -hmm. and like Mm -hmm. I feel like there's like a relatability to Jane there Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the bird thing this quote has nothing to do with birds but I kind of get a bird vibe off of it Mm -hmm. Um, 101 um, she was in her room looking out her window and she says my eyes passed all other objects to rest on those uh, on those most remote the blue peaks um, so the mountains that she sees in the distance on let me see. She longed to follow it farther. 
So mm-hmm. she has that feeling to just, like, fly away and, like, fly off or, like, run away. She does. And, <laughs> definitely. And I think that scene just put that essence into the quote. And I don't... Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not just Jane. Like, I found, like, a quote from Helen where she says, By dying young, I shall escape great sufferings. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's just, like, a huge theme throughout the entire mm-hmm. book. Like, everybody mm-hmm. feels enclosed in some way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, Mr. Rochester's enclosure was having Bertha as a wife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then he escaped by enclosing her. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny, but that actually, like, I like that idea a lot. Mm-hmm. And Thornfield is, like, his prison, too. No and also, way. like, Jane calls people at Lowood and Thornfield inmates, like, all yeah. the time. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which mm-hmm. I think is such a closer, like, enclosure thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like, these girls don't have anywhere else to go. This is the mm-hmm. only home. They're kind of, like, trapped there. Because mm-hmm. they, they don't know anything else. Yeah. yeah. She Definitely. herself. Mm-hmm. Another place, like, with the kind of, like, prison imagery, um, right after she is in the red room when she wakes up in the nursery, um, she wakes up feeling as if she had had a frightful nightmare and seeing before her a terrible red glare crossed with thick black bars. Mm-hmm. So, like, this is after she's gotten out of the red room. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's still, like... She still feels like she's trapped, even though, like, she's out of, like, that enclosure. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Because, like, Gate's head is also, like, an enclosure for her. hmm I think with, like, that inmate thing, like, I think you're gonna say it, Aubrey, like, she's, like, an inmate to her own life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. she calls everyone, like, every place she's been to, she calls people there inmates. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That she's never really, like, mm. been on her own. And I don't think she knows any better. I think she just thinks that everybody in her life is suffering something like she is, in mm-hmm. a way. Like, everybody's an inmate. Everybody's stuck. Because that's how she's been brought up. Oh. And she doesn't see that there's actually people out there living their, like, best lives. <laughs> and, like, not being trapped with Bertha or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like she just thinks there's, like, some sort of inmate um, essence in everybody. And mm-hmm. I don't think she knows any better. She can't, like, find the happiness in her own life. Mm-hmm. Right. Sad. Mm-hmm. Oh, snap. Mm-hmm. I think because she, like, represses all of her feelings. She doesn't look inward for her happiness, almost. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. she doesn't know to. Yeah. Contradicting yeah. myself um, yeah. in what I just said. That same quote that I was, like, stumbling through on 101. Um, when she's longing to surmount the mountains that she sees in the distance. She mentions that she feels like those are her exile limits. Like, the prison ground ends at the base of those mountains. So maybe she does know that there's something out there as she grows older. But as a kid, maybe. Maybe she's just longing for it. She's reaching for something else. But Mm -hmm. she feels like she's trapped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe she doesn't know that there's goodness beyond Mm -hmm. the grounds of Thornfield. She's just hoping. She's like, well, maybe if I get out of here, there's something better. But maybe not. Maybe she doesn't know it, but she wants to believe that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I think, um, in all the situations she's been, she's been given the option. So, when she was at Gateshead, they sent her off to school. So that wasn't her choice, really. Mm-hmm. Then, well, kind of, but not really. Kind of. <clears throat> um, well, she's given the option, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I think by the doctor, right? But she also yeah, had the obligation Ms. to go. Yeah, Miss Reed would have yeah. made her go regardless of her opinion. But mm-hmm. then, so from Lowood, she advertises. And mm-hmm. Someone finds her, so that gives her the option to go. But then after Thornfield, it doesn't... It's not as much as an option as a necessity for her Mm -hmm. to just leave Mm -hmm. and just go. Yeah. And, Mm -hmm. it like, she doesn't know where she's going, but she just goes. And that's kind of, I don't know, an, like, ultimate escape Mm -hmm. in a Mm -hmm. way. Yeah. I feel like every time she leaves somewhere, 
um, it's kind of, she's kind of being pushed to do it, and, and maybe not, like, a person telling her to go, but just no, the feeling, the obligation, yeah. because when she puts the ad in the paper, and Miss Fairfax, like, like, answers, and she goes to Thornfield, um, she had the urge to leave Lowood. Like, mm -hmm. she didn't just, like, oh, I'm going to advertise and, like, do this to better myself. She's like, I need to get out of here. <laughs> because these people are not the best. I and want then, to get out of here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, like, we're not talking about this topic in this episode. Mm -hmm. But, like, it kind of goes with, like, the gothic element. Because she just can't, she can't get out. And, mm -hmm. like, the only way that she can truly escape is mm -hmm. death. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then when she's at Thornfield, like, after she made that choice, not really a choice to leave Lowood, but, like, a better-ish option than Lowood for is Thornfield. Bertha and... <laughs> I cannot say her name without that. It's such Bertha, an unfortunate name. <laughs> <laughs> Bertha and Rochester and everything going on. I, she was... She didn't have a clear headspace and go, you know what? This place is all right, but I think I want to leave. She's just like Bertha's a little funky, and I need, I like, I, I need, need to get to. out here. Mm -hmm. So the people around her and in all these places that she's left have pushed her. She hasn't made the independent choice just based on nothing, just based on her emotion and feeling. Like mm -hmm. I want to go and better my life. She's like, uh, these people are stressing me out, and she, I need to leave. She overstays wherever she is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she's never. I don't think she's ever made an independent. Uh, selfish decision for herself. herself. Yeah. A selfish in a good way. Also, the yeah. Bertha thing, it wasn't just that, like, oh, this woman is mad. Mm -hmm. It was also that. It was also, like, Rochester is technically still married. Yeah. And she views that as immoral. That yes. she would just always be viewed by other people as his mistress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and she, may maybe that was an independent decision of hers. She doesn't like yeah. being looked down upon. Mm -hmm. right. She's been looked down upon her entire life. She wants to be respected. Like, she never... She she has trauma, but she's always worked towards trying to get people to like her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, she says that to Helen in one of the chapters. That she, like, all she wants is people to like her. Mm -hmm. Which is, like, so heartbreaking for, like, us, like... I don't know, young adults, to hear that from, like, a 10-year-old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's unfortunate, especially, like, because when you're taught that your opinion doesn't matter, that you can't find happiness within yourself, mm -hmm. that, like, that, it's just, yeah, it's really hard, it is really heartbreaking because, like, we're taught, like, here and now, that... We're very you, empowered, I think. We are mm -hmm. significantly more empowered mm -hmm. to take advantage of our life, make selfish decisions for ourselves because <clears> we know <throat> that they're going to, like, make the best for us because we're not here to serve everybody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Um, um, that kind of relates to repression, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, I think, so, um, I remember reading the first few chapters when, um, when Jane is, like, recounting her time in the Red Room, mm -hmm. and she meant, she makes some offhand comment, like, she references, uh, like, the Bible or something where she's, like, she knew not what she did to me, like, she not, like, she didn't understand, like, how much she was hurting mm -hmm. her when she was putting her in the Red Room. Definitely. And I was really shocked to read that because, like, at the beginning when you're introduced to this character who's, like, so oppressed, so, mm -hmm. like, abused, why is she so forgiving all of a sudden? Like, all the, right. like, True. already here. And, like, that comes up a lot later when she goes back to Gateshead to visit. Mm -hmm. And she comes back and she's, like, she sees Mrs. Reed on her deathbed. Mm -hmm. And she sees how much it's hurting her that she also, mm -hmm. that she did that to Jane. Yeah. And that she's feeling the guilt from that. And, like, Jane has moved on from, like, feeling angry about it. Yeah. And that her escape from that has let her, like, grow past it and, mm -hmm. like, overcome it. And all of a sudden, like, she's like, I'm gonna forgive you, like, let me kiss you or whatever. Uh -huh. yeah. Like, show some affection. And it's just mm -hmm. crazy that she was able to, like, grow past that even though... 
Like, it was such a horrible experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that connects to Mr. Rochester because when she Mm -hmm. gets out of there after Bertha's incident and just that discovery, Mm -hmm. I think she knows, she didn't, like, explicitly state this, but she says, or she doesn't say, she probably thinks that he doesn't get it, like, how Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she feels like he's trying to change her with, like, all the fancy clothes and the jewels Mm -hmm. And, like, taking his name and, like, getting married. And then Bertha's there and she doesn't like it. He doesn't get any of that. Why she'd want to be plain. Why she doesn't want to be looked at as a mistress. He just can't wrap his head around it. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of why she leaves. Because she's like, I'm not going to fight this battle with mm-hmm. him. Trying to get him to understand, this is not what I need. Cause he, I'm out. he doesn't try to understand her. Mm-hmm. He tries to make her look like Ingram. And, like, give her all these fancy things when she just Mm -hmm. wants to be plain. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but that's also, like, her repressing herself because that's all she's ever been told. That's what she was taught at Lowood to be plain. Well, Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of that way. I think there's two different ways to look at it. Like, some, like, one way would be, like, feminism, like, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. Like, I like my simplicity. I like that my mind is what is good about me like Mm -hmm. her teaching she's knowledgeable she's that and she's not trying to compensate by looking pretty yeah and that's the reason why Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. if you fell in love with me like this then this is what you're gonna get i'm not gonna change Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think just because of this marriage it's because like she doesn't have any self-love like you know when she was like drawing and she drew mr rochester and like like she Someone said that it was like ugly, like the drawing looked ugly, and mm-hmm. she was like, are. and she was like staring at it, like and she really liked it. I feel like she should do that for herself. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. she looks up to people, and she doesn't look up to herself. I mm-hmm. also think that ugly comment on the picture of Rochester wasn't like that the drawing was ugly. It was just that yeah, he as a person is ugly. Yeah. No, he said, and I yeah, think yeah. that kind of alludes to her wanting to leave later on because like. Hey, that guy's ugly. Not just physically, well, obviously in that stance, but I think you can take that as a deeper down thing. He's just an ugly person. Yeah. Not mm-hmm. somebody you want to be with. Yeah. And maybe that kind of alludes to his secret coming out about Bertha and mm-hmm. just being oh, crappy yeah. in general and not... Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I just mean, thought that right now, so I yeah. can't, like, p- portray it without yeah. sounding... it definitely is foreshadowing it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I think... On other foreshadowing, it's, I don't remember which chapter it is specifically, but it's the one where uh, Rochester is, like, telling her to leave mm-hmm. because he's going to get married to Miss Ingram, and um, it's the one with, like, the chestnut tree cracks. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, in the footnotes, there's a lot of foreshadowing using, like, the fall from Eden and, like, the Adam oh. and Eve story. Like, that's a really big thing throughout the entire chapter that, like, leading up like even like that's when like they confess their love to each other mm-hmm. and they're like let's get married oh i love you so much mm-hmm. and like the entire time it's like no this isn't actually mm-hmm. what's gonna happen and like our like reading the book when like we got to that point i was like why is the book so much longer because like that seems like it's yeah. gonna be such a strong resolution exactly. no i talked to miss butler about this i was like it's so amazing that it's not the end yeah. Of the book. Yeah. It could have easily been the end. But yeah. I think that's part of the feminist move in this book. That mm-hmm. it, that is not her end. Falling yeah. in love and getting married is not the end of the it's not the uh-huh. happy ending of the book. That's yeah. like a shift in her character. Mm-hmm. Like, like a big major one. one. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that immediate like, I'm gonna marry you, Rochester type of a thing and like their kiss and all that hoopla. Um, Mm -hmm. it's just kind of her, maybe the disempowerment aspect of her childhood and like the repression, finally finding somebody who Mm -hmm. doesn't make her feel like a complete fool or like a completely terrible person and just Mm -hmm. jumping the gun. Yeah. Yeah. Temptation. Even though he Mm -hmm. wants to like spend more time with her and be more intimate, whatever. And she's like holding off until they get married or whatever. Like, I think her agreeing to get married is still jumping the gun, even though it seems like she's the one that's kind of holding back. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Yeah, like, Miss Fairfax tells her, like, you need to be careful. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna be honest here. Mm-hmm. I didn't read past, uh, where she walks away, but, mm-hmm. but maybe, like... Yeah. 
she like walks away from her past with walking away from Rochester. I don't know. Maybe that's like the the climax of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or so one of them at least. She's sent out of Eden. Yeah. yeah. Kind of in yeah. a way, but that like going along with that, like the sent being sent out of Eden isn't the end. Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In that story. Just to verify, are we all just up to 27? Has anybody read significantly uh, beyond that? No. I think I read 28. <laughs> all right, Miss Butler. So we're all at 27. <laughs> so that's why this discussion really is so limited. Yeah, I'm, at, I'm reading 28 We're going to do right a now. recap podcast <laughs> episode when we get to the end of the book. Mm-hmm. I think. So yeah, yeah. yeah. just we'll, summing up some stuff we that have we more topics, right? right. No, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And it'll yeah. be a good closure thing for all of us. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So bring up any any of these three topics at the end, the last podcast. All right. So <laughs> we'll see you next week, boys. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, this is the end. <laughs> this has been Jane Hour. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.